everyone, welcome to the show. So this is Biometric Update, and on December 10th they wrote an article about Exto Labs. And it says that ExoPay can interface with payments and banking systems via APIs to provide a new digital money solution and Tier 2 retail CBDC platform, and an interledger layer allows wallet holders with one bank to transact with wallets issued by another. And then it says that Exto India is expected to launch soon. So this is their demo at a minute 35. Uh, there's kind of gets interesting. I can't play this because there's music in it that I don't own the license to, but I'll add the link in the description below. This is Exto Pay at a Sing Singapore FinTech Festival, and the Monetary Authority of Singapore had a hackathon where different uh, technology uh, companies uh, kind of competed for CBDC technology. So listen to this. Uh, hello. I'm Orang Dialame, the CEO and co-founder of Exto Labs. Our team is excited to be part of the CBDC challenge. ExtoPay is the result of three years of development by a world-class multidisciplinary team. ExtoPay supports a two-tier CBDC distribution model and is a hybrid account and token-based system. The ExtoPay backend features a modified version of the XRP ledger made to support permission DLT clusters. It can interface with a tier one CBD system and banking and payment systems via APIs. An interledger layer enables an open loop payment system, allowing wallet holders of one bank to transact with wallets issued by another. Exto card and mobile wallets provide universal access for consumers and merchants with or without smartphone or connectivity. Deviceless consumers can access their accounts via plastic QR codes and their biometrics verified on the merchant or agent Exto cards. Consumer All right, so they're working with a modified version of the XRP ledger, so it sounds a lot like the fork ledgers that are private right for the CBDC platforms like we've seen with Bhutan and they're using this modified version for their ExoPay. Now they're also connected to Interledger Protocol and Interledger Protocol has something called pathfinding so it finds the route that's the cheapest or most liquid route right so when I'm sending a payment it'll try to find different routes to send the payment. Now, XRP is optimized for Interledger protocol, and it's, uh, you know, it, XRP offers very quick, very cheap transactions. So if a bank or any other uh, business or, or whatever company decides to use XOPay, or, or even just for remittances, right, if I'm looking for the cheapest possible route, it's most likely going to be the XRP rail. Now, you know, banks might not have the regulations to use a crypto asset rail. There might be, um, it might not be liquid enough for a huge bank to send money across the XRP rail, but it's in the protocol, so it's available. For merchants. We demonstrated a photo ID based onboarding process. Uh, users with identities on the system are issued a recovery key during onboarding, which is linked to their ID and used for recovery. Multi-factor authentication and time locks protect this KYC recovery path. We also support an anonymous mode on the system. Neg our objective is to enable free consumer transactions and negligible merchant transaction fees. Based on user opt-in via digital signatures, credit risk data provided to banks can generate revenues. Consumer shopper marketing data for brands and retail channel partners can also lead to additional monetization. We're working on a system on a chip which integrates all functions needed using ultra-low power ASIC methods, lowering power by 10x and cost by 2x. Our hackathon technology stack is based on proven modules and subsystems that are deployed in the market and address problem statements one through six. We have also completed design and API interfaces for integration with Alluvial's open banking platform and Mojo Loop switch for banking and payment system integration, as well as R3's Corda tier one system. Extopay is near pilot ready. 
We're about planning to launch it as an e-money solution in India and Kenya with local partners in 22. So India is an interesting area, right? We've been seeing a lot of banks that are partners, RippleNet in India are, are um, there's a lot of just movement happening in India. So uh, recently there's a David Schwartz interview where he was talking about technology at an uh, Indian technology conference. And then uh, this is a modified version of BRD wallet as well. So BRD, they are, they're uh, SBI crypto invested in BRD and they, they actually have a coin and everything. They're, uh, they're a crypto wallet platform. So it's interesting how this is all playing out. Um, there is a there. This is also a self-sovereign identity, so I can put my fingerprint on this chip, and it'll it'll directly lead my fingerprint to my uh, twelve words, my private key. So just setting up this wallet, you have to KYC, and it's tied to your biometric. So it's pretty interesting technology now. I trust Capital has updated their their site. They've done a terrific job in a new design, as well as they've added Google 2FA to their to their site. So if you're putting any crypto on an exchange, which you know you probably shouldn't have crypto on an exchange, but if for some reason you do have crypto on an exchange, it's really good to have Google 2FA enabled on the exchange as well as the email tied to the exchange. When I'm talking to cybersecurity experts, they all have recommended that. And if you use my link, itrust.capital slash Darren, you'll get a $100 funding reward just for you signing up to the platform. And they also have precious metals on the platform. And as you know, IRAs have some incentives to set you're incentivized to have an IRA because it protects you against a lot of capital gains. So XDOPay is enabling offline transactions. We just saw something with something called XPOP at Apex at the XRP conference where you're able to send transactions offline. So it's interesting. As well as Exto Africa, which is a partner of XDOPay, it's kind of a subsidiary. Uh, we partner with central banks, private banks, fintechs, e-commerce, telcos, large merchants, and FMCG to bring financial inclusion for all. Now, this is uh, another video that's that uh, this was the guy in the first one that's part of ExoPay. So they're also laying out uh, CBDCs and, and R3. And all the features that you need to, to, to do. Uh, offline payments and um, you know so, some of the uh, features that are needed in a retail uh, you know scenario. Um, I think uh, it's very important for these systems to be open loop. So um, you know what you see here is that we can essentially run instances like this for different financial service providers or payment providers and. Uh, um, that's one of the big attributes that we've gotten away. As mobile money has come out, everything is a walled garden, <laughs> which is an app, or and that that's creating um, a lot of data monopolies and winner takes all type scenarios that um, don't work well uh, for consumers. One of the fundamental attributes of the system, also we're trying to address, is this balance between data. You know, and pri you know, compliance and privacy, and um, I think at the heart of that is the digital identity system that we built into this. So, all right, so they built in a digital identity with their biometrics, right? And they've modified the BRD wallet, and this is your fingerprint uh, sensor. This is also a way to link your your facial recognition to this chip. And it kind of links to your phone and everything. And this is their biometrics partnership is Ether, Ethernom, which is making the smart card and everything. So some of their partnerships are Health Passports and Nestin. When I was looking into Nestin, it looked pretty interesting. They're um, Internet of Things and all different types of, of, of use cases. And one of their use cases is an alarm for social distancing to be six feet away. So I found that interesting. 
Now this is uh, he's he's uh, in charge of a huge sovereign wealth fund in in the uh, UAE. They come with the territory. You know, we we were designed to. Uh, do you think it's transitory? The inflation. It's transitory. It's absolutely transitory. I take a long term view on the United States, and I have a I continue to have a positive bullish view on the U.S. market. Yeah, um, cryptocurrencies. Is that something that is a business as a sovereign wealth fund you're looking at? Well, first of all, uh, I think it's real. Yeah. Uh, I think, you know, this is a business that had, what, $200 billion worth of uh, crypto value two years ago, and it's $2.5 trillion today and, and growing. Yeah. So uh, I think, well, many people are skeptics. I, I, I do not fall in that category. I think now I see it as, as real. Now, I think the regulatory environment that's, that, that isn't there yet in its, uh, in its final form and will have to be there at some point, I think we'll come in and we'll help, I think, um, transition uh, this, this asset class into, into something new. From our perspective, I think we look at the uh, ecosystem around uh, crypto and I think we are investing in that ecosystem. That could be, that's in the blockchain technology, uh, energy usage, uh, etc. So uh, that's my answer to that. Keldun, it's wonderful to have you. Thank you so much for joining. All right. So in some of my older videos, I, uh, I found clips of Kevin O'Leary talking about the upside to crypto. And he talks about the Middle East and their sovereign wealth funds getting into crypto. So he says that, you know, the regulations, eventually they'll come. But right now they're investing in the ecosystems that they can invest in. And now... Mubadala Investment Company acquired a minority stake in London-listed Finabler as an, as an embattled payments company hired an advisor to help assets in financial situations. So if you guys have been uh, keeping up with this, Finabler is a RippleNet partner. And it says down here, too, Finabler is one of the companies in the region to work with Ripple. And it's interesting that this guy is saying that there's it's it, crypto is real. We're investing in the ecosystems, and it turns out that they're investing in Fidabler, which is using RippleNet. So I found that interesting. They're a sovereign wealth fund, and they have over 232 billion in assets, and they're also. Uh, in, in addition to a Brazil focus investment business and you know in Brazil the, there was information that shows that Brazil's working with the forked version of the XRP ledger too so I found that interesting this is Barry Sternlich and he is a multi-billionaire so, I mean I, this is for me but if you have five percent of your net worth there's only one thing they haven't, in, in a world where the government just prints money and 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 doesn't seem to have any consequences, sometimes that will end. And the only thing they can't make more of is Bitcoin. It's never been hacked. It has no real value other than there's 21 million coins, infinitely divisible. Gold really doesn't have a lot of value. Um, you know, you can have your gold jewelry, but it could be silver or titanium or platinum. So... You know, in a world where there's infinite, where you could have the Weimar Republic, you know, I, I, we all have probably seen that. Was it Rwanda? What country was it where they have like 10 billion? Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe dollar, right? So you could see the world saying to the U.S., especially with our political isolationism, that we, they would say, you know, China's going to try to knock us off the dollar standard. And they're going to have a lot of countries align with them with a bridge and tunnel, a road and tunnel, whatever you call it program so they're going to try really hard it's very obvious they're going to try really hard to break the dollar standard if that happens and the dollar devalues you need one thing that could hold its value and the th that thing literally in a scare it'll go down with the stock market by the way and then in my opinion it will reverse and it would go to a million a coin it could do that because everyone it's not u.s investors the whole world will look at one thing that they can't make more of and that would be bitcoin so it might be, you know, there are other coins, but they kind of were there first. It, is the mar it has, has no function other than a store of value. So having a little investment in Bitcoin, I think might be a smart little hedge in your life because your paper will be worthless. 
unfortunately. And I'm, I have like, you know, 2% of my net worth in, in, in cryptocurrencies and a selection of them. So if this was five years ago and you worked for an investment bank and you suggested to buy Bitcoin, you'd get fired, right? Or if you did buy Bitcoin and it crashed, you'd get fired. So these billionaires leaning into crypto gives confidence to the institutions, gives confidence to the workers from the institution that they can invest in crypto and not look like a complete moron if it all fails. And this is Elon Musk, and he kind of speaks about about uh, Bitcoin's use case. Nature of money for ours, because I played a significant role in creating uh, PayPal. Right. Um, and so my understanding of the, the money system at a fundamental level of how it actually works, the detailed mechanics of it, is I think there's, there are very few people that understand it better than me. Bitcoin uh, is an interesting example, obviously the, the prime mover on this, um, but the transaction volume of Bitcoin is low, yeah. uh, and the cost per transaction is high. It is, uh, at least at its base level, uh, suitable for maybe an exchange, a, a store of value. But fundamentally, um, Bitcoin is not uh, a good substitute for transactional currency. Right. Um, and um, even though it was, it, it was created as a silly joke, Dogecoin is uh, better suited for transactions. Why is that? The, the total transaction flow uh, that you can do with, with um, Dogecoin is substantially more than, like transactions per day is, is, is much higher than, right. has much higher potential than, than Bitcoin. Uh, it is uh, slightly inflationary. Um, but that inflationary number is a fixed number as opposed to a percentage. Right. So that means over time, its percentage inflation actually decreases. And that's actually good because it encourages people to spend and ra rather than sort of hoard it as a store of value. I'm going to switch to... A All right. So he just, he just said that, you know, Bitcoin's a store of value, but it doesn't really make sense for transactions. And that's XRP's use case, right? So he understands the problem very well, and he's he's talking about Dogecoin for transactional volume. But what about the XRP ledger, and that's transactional volume, right? So he understands this problem really well, and I think he's more active in crypto than than um, than just buying that one thing of Bitcoin. Which I'll skip over this. But listen to Peter Schiff about the economy. So something goes up, consumers will naturally buy less of it and they'll substitute something else. The classic example is steak and chicken. If the cost of steak goes up a lot, consumers won't actually buy the steak. They'll stop buying steak and they'll buy chicken instead. And so it was argued that, hey, if consumers aren't buying the more expensive stuff, then why should it be in the CPI? After all, people aren't buying it. Their cost of living isn't really going up because they're not buying the expensive steak. They're buying less expensive chicken. So we should take that steak out of the CPI and we should put in chicken because that's what people are actually buying. And so they adjust the CPI to reflect those changes. And while that may makes sense on the surface. Oh yeah, people aren't really paying those higher prices. They're not paying those higher prices because they can't afford it. People wanted to have steak. They preferred steak. They just got priced out of the market because of inflation. And so in order to survive, they had to substitute lower quality food items because that's what they could afford. But this is no longer measuring the cost of living. If the CPI, Consumer Price Index, is supposed to measure the cost of living, it makes no sense to include substitution because that's the cost of surviving. As I've said many times, by that logic, if chicken becomes so expensive that people can't even afford that and they start eating dog food instead of chicken, well, let's put dog food in the CPI. Oh, look, there's no inflation. Food prices aren't going up. Look, it's not cost. All right, guys. So, so Peter's uh, saying, you know, the CPI data is altered. It's changed at all times. And in this video, it kind of explains that, you know, the CPI would be much higher if we used the same CPI model that we used in the past. And he also talks about the price of food is being excluded and they're s substituting steak for chicken. And then eventually we're going to lead to dog food. And now this is Larry Fink from BlackRock. We are managing their assets for 
And so we look at this as probably the most exciting thing in my professional career. And in addition, if we could also aggressively invest in nascent new technologies to advance quickly the new technologies to eliminate carbon, this is going to be fantastic. You know, one little simple thing, if all human beings just stopped eating beef, and we started eating synthetic meat or uh, vegetarian meat. What people don't realize, cows are responsible for 6% of the carbon footprint in the world. Airplanes that gets all the publicity represents 0.85, less than 1% of the carbon footprint. I mean, so there's all these things we have to understand what's causing carbon and how do we now change it. So much of it's going to have to be consumer preference changes, too. Yeah. So BlackRock has issued statements before the Fed even issued policy. They had a white paper on how the central bank should react to uh, to some type of, uh, you know, economic downturn. And they've laid out the plan that the Fed's doing today. So uh, BlackRock is influential in, in what's happening in this world, right? And he's, he's kind of saying, you know, we should uh, be leaning away from, from steak. We should be moving more towards synthetic meat. So I found that interesting, and yeah, I found that interesting. So I just wanted to share that with you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. If you want, please like, please subscribe. If you have any comments, suggestions, please write them down below. Even criticisms, as long as they're polite, I don't mind criticisms. I welcome criticisms. It helps me become a better better uh, YouTuber. So I hope you guys enjoyed the show. Thanks, everyone.